Because I wander when I talk. It was higher than it was before, so be careful. Here's a hazard yeah. given to use the remote. Yeah. Let me introduce Victor Bell to those of you who haven't met Victor. Uh, I hadn't met Keith before today, so I didn't have a long introduction from him. But Victor, I've, I've known since 1975. Uh, Victor was the pioneer for recycling for DEM. So he was the original blue box guy at DEM. Uh, he then went on to work for SAIC uh, in Newport and for about 20 years now has had his own company. 20 years exactly. 20 years exactly has had his own company uh, based in uh, Jamestown, uh, which is advising governments and uh, very large companies on their environmental packaging <coughs> needs and issues and keeping track of legislation around the world as different countries have said you must conform to this standard or that. So in terms of a global outlook on plastics and rain pollution, uh, Victor, you've got the floor. And it's also one, I shouldn't mention this, but uh, at the SPC, I was just awarded the most outstanding person of the year this year from, from the SPC. So well, actually last the SPC year, is what? Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Okay. And with Keats as a member of, so I was, you know, so obviously involved with the how to recycle labor and all those issues, and with all the committees that um, ACC is on. So who we are, we were established in, in 1998 in James Howard Island. We specialize in, in environmental, global environmental clients regarding packaging, electronics, and batteries around the world. We track all environmental regulations for all our clients. Our clients include um, a number of the big guys, everyone from, from um, Nike to Hasbro to Dow to um, the Coke brothers this week, believe it or not, are calling me for we're doing work for them at the moment for something you don't want to know about. Yeah. Uh, um, all the big, um, the big, the, the, the big Estee Lauders, the, the, the um, crafts, we track every bag and styrene law and straw law in the country for people like McDonald's and Chick-fil-A to make sure they understand what where they have to change, what they have to do. We also do all the environmental footprints of all the packaging systems around the world. So what I'm trying to do today is just give you a little brief of what's going on around the world, what's going on with legislation around the world specifically, and in the United States in particular, about all the things you're talking about here, where it's going, what's what's happening, and what is it. And one thing I do want to just mention is I agree, I agree totally with with Keith on that plastic's a good material. It's very useful for what we do. It makes a lot of sense. But somehow in the last 20 years, they sort of lost their license because they let pieces of get out of control. And yes, we need to use packaging. I just um, one of the people that we deal with together has a great picture, which I should have put on my presentation, of, of a, a stack of packaging for diapers, which was about as big as three of these tables in plastic, as compared to a whole wall like that of cardboard boxes if you had to ship it that way, which didn't make sense. But we have to be able to deal with the plastics. So around the world, the big mantra is this circular economy is to keep things in motion. And one of the areas with, one of the issues why we're dealing with plastic is plastic has lost a lot of its circularity, especially in this country, where other places in the world it's become much more circular than here because they have much higher recycling rates or collection rates, uh, and they, they're using it. And then we also lost a lot of the circularity, which we thought we had, which we had phony circularity when we were shipping all our stuff to China or our ways to China, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, everyone is looking at that. A lot of people in the United States, instead of calling it um, the circular economy, they don't want to do that, they want to call it SMM, that's um, Sustainable Materials Management, which integrate more life cycle thinking in it. But all the new circular economy is adding that life cycle thinking also. So in Europe, because of this economy, um, basically in Europe, we, the, the, the circular economy package was just passed in the legislation last year, and the new packaging and packaging waste directives were just passed. And, they're going, and, and that law makes every country in Europe, or member state in Europe, 
had at least 70% of all packaging recycled by 2030, 100% um, of all packaging to be recyclable. And that's a big issue, is making sure it is recyclable. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that and, and, and how a lot of industries are trying to do that. Um, also, you can see the UK has very similar, but their goals are 2025. So, but the, the, but the actual goals for plastic in, in Europe is 50% recycling, getting it all recycled by 2025, 55% getting it that We're probably at about 18% now in this country. Um, in Germany, though, their goals are by 2019, by this year, 90% of all plastics got to be recycled. Now, some of that is being collected and used temporarily for some um, energy, energy uses, but they're doing that in order to collect these in certain commodities in order to create demand. And we'll be able to, and, and their mechanical recycling goals are like 70%, which where their, where their full recycling goals are uh, 90%. Um, a lot of this, and, and Keith was, was mentioning this, that one of the big problems we had, and one of the big problems we're having in, even in the, state, in the state of Rhode Island, is we have this China sword. And basically what has happened in the past is that we've had this huge outlet. It used to cost, it cost less to ship a bale of plastic bottles from, China, from, from the port of LA to China than it does to ship that bale from LA to San Francisco because of the empty bottles, the use of it going to it. And we were sending it there and, and we would say, okay, for every bale we sent out, we got all that was 100% recycled. But guys, it would get to China and China would clean it up and throw away the bad stuff. And they were really only recycling 65 to 70% of what they got in, the rest was actually being recycled. So we were counting our rates as everything put on that bale was gone, but it really wasn't gone. And also the material was um, very poor quality, so we were not incentivized to create good bales out of all the globe in the U.S. Because we had this big sucking machine in China taking all our, our materials. So they've been threatening this and been doing this for five years, and they've been tightening it up, tightening it up, and tightening it up. And so now, if you're going to show, a lot of the material started going to other countries, but now that's being stopped. And just in August, um, Rhode Island Resource Recovery basically stated, hey, they stopped shipping to China, but they were going to other international de 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 destinations. But their value, what they're getting for their material has dropped dramatically. So where in the past in Rhode Island, the cities and towns would bring material to the material processing facility, and they would actually get some form of kickback for the value of the materials. But those kickbacks are gone. The value of this material is gone now. Um, it's very hard to market the material. Um, so especially, especially material from the United States because the United States is, has a uniqueness to it. We are the only country that has single stream recycling that includes glass. And since our system collects mixed materials, including glass, our material is much harder to separate and the quality of the material is much lower than anywhere else. So it's harder to get markets for that material. So in a sense, those are, those are some of the issues that are going on. So, yes, the China store moved it away, and then for a few years, we saw big blups of more material going to Malaysia, India, Vietnam, and Thailand. And now, all of a sudden, they don't want it anymore. Most Malaysia stopped shipping, Malaysia and Vietnam stopped shipping these materials. Thai, Thailand has, has said no more for two years, but they have stockpiles now of these bales sitting in the ports in these areas, all the, all, all the countries, here we are shipping our garbage to all the companies who are the biggest waste and the big marine. So our stuff is becoming the marine debris in those countries. So even though we are not doing it, it was all becoming the marine debris in those countries. But 
What's happening now, if any of you have heard of the, the Basel Convention, the Basel Convention is the international rules for transporting hazardous materials. And, and what's happening is this looming ban, because they have been looking at this and they're about to ban the export of any bales of this material that is not with, that does not meet this 0.05% contamination rate to go any of these third-party countries. So where people are counting on other countries around the world to potentially take our waste, this is going to be considered, the, this, is the, this, is the, this is the International Convention for the Control of the Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste. And so they are looming this ban against this. So where a lot of the companies are asking people to, um, Oh, let's find other international third country markets, you know, to, to take this material. This is going to stop it. So we have to come up with solutions in this country. So one of the solutions that, that, that we deal a lot with is what's called the New Plastic Economy Amendment. This is based on the Eleanor MacArthur Foundation. And this, is, this was originally formed in October. And since then, 250 organizations, including, and I'll show you who they are, including major, and, and major you know, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, have joined this organization. This, they made the commitment to eliminate unnecessary plastic, not necessary all plastic, but unnecessary plastic. They want all plastic packaging to be recyclable, reusable, by 2025, and they want to make sure that there is the market for all this. <coughs> this represents 20% of all the plastic manufactured, sold, and made into packaging around the world. Now we have 72 retailers and all the different, different people joining this. But what is scary about this, like a lot of my companies are afraid to join this, a lot of them have joined this, is that they have this definition of recycling. And they're all afraid that, well, they'll be able to meet this in Europe because of Europe, the European, because of the European commitment to collect all plastics, and the European has separate, we set, you know, separate collections so they don't mix it all together, that they'll be able to meet these definitions for their products in Europe, but they probably won't be able to meet them in the United States because the United States doesn't have the funding for the infrastructure to collect a lot of the flexible films that we know we're working on and all that. So, it's, it's, so they're nervous of how we're going to do this. So basically what they say that a package or a package is recyclable if it is successfully, post-consumerly collected, sorted, and then recycled actually is proven and at scale. So at scale, yeah, in Germany it's going to be. Next year it's going to be. But in the United States, it's not going to be done. That if you get that by 2025, it's going to be difficult. Um, so and also it, 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 it's making sure the design. It also requires that 95% of that package is recyclable. That actually gets recycled, and the other 5% can't contaminate the system. And as Keith knows, because he works very closely with APR, the Association of Plastic Recyclers, they have come up with standards to get companies to design their package correctly. So it makes it easier so those packaging can go to that return to retail system in the in the plastic bag program. So that those bag, so those systems increase the value of your stuff coming out of your MRF, out of the Rhode Island recovery facility. So one of the big issues here is a number of countries, states around the country are looking at setting up design standards, saying that all packaging must meet these APR standards, or, and there's also standards in the paper side too, to make them recyclable, one, to contaminate, increase the value of the recycling coming out of the, out of the system. So who's involved in this? Or, you know, all the big companies, L'Oreal, Nestle's, um, Cofer, um, Danny, S.C. Johnson, 
J&J, Walmart, Coca-Cola, all have signed this commitment. Well, who have else signed these commitments is government agencies. We have the city of Austin. We have the government of France. We have the, Scot the Scottish government. We have all these government journeys. And one of the things I'm thinking of, boy, wouldn't it be a good thing for the governor to be the first state in the United States to, to, to sign the policies to become part of the, the, the Yellow and MacArthur Foundation for the new plastics economy? What it, where, where it, 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 it's, it's, it's passing these goals, but not, you know, this is, this is supporting a supportive role. And so what is one of the recommendations we do have, though? But um, this, the, the, um, th this is becoming a very big area. And also all of his partners, Suez, are all members of, of, the, new, of, the, of the new plastic economy. I mean, obviously, yes, we, we saw um, cleanups, but, but the, the Ocean and Disturbance, the R report shows that um, in the Operation Clean Sweep, from um, the, their study showed that besides cigarette butts, everything else on this list is uh, is packaging and plastic of the ten largest um, plastic and things that ending up on the beaches. And one of the things we also notice is, and, and a new policy. In fact, there was an NPR story about this last night on NPR about people going around and going after these folks by not only picking up the litter and going from what is a grocery bag, but what brands they are. And this shows how big Coca-Cola footprint is when you pick up a Coca-Cola product, a McDonald's, Nestle's, Pepsi. This is all, this is, this is global looking at these products and picking them up and showing where, where they're coming from and who belongs to them. And this has got their attention. You know, this is, when we're not looking, we're looking at their brands instead of looking at what, it's a, it's a, it's a soda bottle or a water bottle. It's a Coca-Cola bottle. So one of the ways that this is being addressed around the world from all of these issues is extended producer responsibility. So what extended public producer responsibility is, is where in, in, in all of these countries, all the blues are online, all the yellows are coming online, the greens have partial legislation, or in effect partially in that country, um, is where the cost of managing waste, whether it's plastic or paper, is paid for by the people putting it on the market. So if you go to Vancouver, Procter & Gamble, J&J, Estee Lauder, Starbucks, all pay the cost of what it will cost to dispose of that waste, to manage that waste, on a yearly basis, they, they, they do a bill. We actually do all the reporting for J and J, Eli Lilly, um, Nike. We do all their global reporting and how much they actually put on the market, and then they have to pay a fee for Ralph the PET bottle. They pay a certain fee if it's a if it's a flexible film. They pay a higher fee because it's harder to dispose of. It's not less value, and also it pays for so that pays for the the city and town collection, so no longer does your cities and towns pay for the collection of the material, it's paid for by this funds. And, and it also subsidizes the market. Now what's really critical about this right now is because all the rest of the world has, it's in Canada, it, 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 it's um, in every country in Europe, it just started in Russia two years, a year and a half ago. India starts in 2020, and same with China in 2020. So all of Europe, when it comes to marketing their recycled materials, their marketing is subsidized. So if you have a new industry that wants to invest in, 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 new, in using materials, in guaranteeing prices, they're going to go to a country 
that has EPR. We're seeing a lot of new technology coming on in, 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 in Canada now because they have the material, they have cleaner material, and they know that it's subsidized. Here, it's very, the, the, when the price goes down, it just costs us more in the landfill fees, right? So it's not, it, 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 it's not even, so one of the things, and, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, so, so the trends are on all these EPR fees is it's going all around the world. We're moving to 100% responsibility. We also have, like in France, if you do something stupid, if you design a package bad, if you sell a paper envelope with bubble wrap inside of it, which ends up in the paper stream, you pay a double fee. If you put a, a piece of aluminum on your PET bottle, which affects the um, processing of that PET, you pay a fee. If you make an opaque, um, an opaque Listerine bottle for, a, you know, you pay a double fee because it hurts the value of the material coming out of the resource recycling. What they've also done is they're now linking these fees to marine debris. So that they're using this for collection mechanisms, um, beach cleanups, they're using that meat for, for, for many other issues, including um, in the river for, 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 structural, for structural issues. Also, they're now covering new SUPs. SUPs are single-use plastics, you know. So, you know, they're, they're also putting fees on things like straws, things on things that are not, thing, uh, other things that are single-use plastic. They're putting fees on those things. Um, in fact, in, in, in Europe, every country has to now have fees on clothing, on textiles, starting in two years. France already does, because so much of the clothing, when you wash it, you have microfibers going out from the clothing into the plastic environment. So they are now charging fees, and also so much clothing now, because clothing has become this unbelievable commodity. Mess. So those are all being part of these new EPR programs. So in Europe, we're seeing them all being updated. China coming online, India coming online. Most of Canada's online. We have Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan already online. Um, also, by the way, India now is banning all single-use plastics by 2022. And Europe has its new, new single-use plastic directive, which was just finalized. Also in the United States, though, we have, all of a sudden there's a lot of movement and discussion, a lot with clients who, who were against EPR or against funding. I said, wait a second, we've got to do something. And um, just yesterday, um, the state of Washington uh, introduced a um, new plastic only is, um, stewardship bill or extended producer responsibility bill just in, 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 um, in, in, in Washington. And this would require that all plastic, the, the, the producers, and if this is the brand owners, the person who actually determines the design and puts it on the market, would pay those costs of that. And this was next week. Um, also, the state of New Jersey just passed a resolution coming, looking at requiring all manufacturers of single-use plastic products to get responsible and coming up with a potential EPR. So there's a lot of work being done around the country on either full EPR programs or just plastic right now. Okay, so let's go into other issues. Bags. Um, right now, um, the UN reported that 66% of all countries have single-use plastic restrictions, um, and they, 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 they list them. I'm not going to go into detail there. Let's talk about the United States. In the United States, we have 600, as of last week, we have 616 laws that place a restriction um, or fees on plastic bags, straws, cutleries, 
expanded polystyrene food wear. Approximately 59% of those are um, related to bags, and the remainder are related to EPS or straws, and then three combined both. As you can see, they cover a lot of you know, countries and states. Um, you notice there were 234 in California. California now has a statewide goal, but it allowed, it allowed the individual municipalities to ma maintain their existing laws in, 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 in top for that. Um, on the polystyrene for bags, you have um, 64 with bans on polystyrene, and you have 36% of them um, that basically also have bans, but also have recyclability or compostability requirements on those issues. So as you can see, the number of these, these laws are going forward. Um, in the United States, we do have a sort of a strange thing also happening. We have some states that don't allow, that passed legislation in the last two years to prevent municipalities from having bans. Though, what happened was a lot of those had municipalities that already had bans, like Florida, and the Florida communities are keeping the bans anyway, and they're, because they passed them beforehand. Rhode Island, you have um, these cities and towns with existing bans. It's pending in there against the dividend. Um, but one of the things we wore, this is, this is Keith's program right here. This is all the collection locations for those plastic bags where you can bring them back. And one of the problems that's happening is because of some of the bag bans, some of the retailers who used to be taking the bags are not. So we're making sure that when we do legislation, because in that grocery store, they may not be selling you a plastic bag anymore or giving you a plastic bag, but they have 5,000 items in packaging that could potentially go into that program from the wrap around the plastic, the, um, your, your, your napkins to your diaper bag, to all those programs can all go in that. Plus they have their fruit bags and um, you know veggie bags, so and plus they put the shrink wrap around the meats and all that. So so we are we are basically saying that if you're going to pass a, a statewide um, bag requirement, um, you also make sure that they still have those those issues. What? Can I, Victor, could I add something on that? The, um, you know, California does include, does have a requirement that retailers continue to recycle their mm -hmm. bags. Nobody enforces it. That's We've seen a dramatic decline in recycling of the other film at grocery stores as a result. So there, there's a big drop in the number of bins to collect them. And um, what that will result in is more film in your material recovery facilities. But there's two things we need there, though. We all, not only need the, the stuff collected in, 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 in Keith's program, um, so not, not yours personally. You know. Not my personal program. Though. Exactly. <laughs> um, but we also need more markets. Most of this material is going to trucks for making decades. Okay? Most of it is going to trucks. And um, we really need more. We were working with a huge, um, the second largest internet company in the United States. And we were working with them to try to make their, they send a lot of, if you buy a clothing piece, you get it in a, in a plastic bag, either a bubble plastic bag, and we're trying to get that to be able to go into Keith's program, but they have this big paper label on it. And right now, if I asked Trex a year ago if they'd take it, they said yes. But I asked them this week, and they said no, we're not going to allow that to be in it, because because they need more markets. And at the same time, we're telling this internet person, we want you to put 20 or 30% recycled content in those bags. And just like California has bad laws to put recycled content in, in, in um, garbage bags and things like that, to put recycled content in those things. Yes, sir. Victor, if I may just add that comment that you made about Trex is, is an excellent one. At Resource Recovery right now, we're in a position of having to refuse loads of recyclable film because Trex will not take any more from us. We have nowhere else to go with it. 
See? Yeah, it's a challenge, and it gets back to the theme of the economics of recycling. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of these we need is recycling content. We need the science for that. Yeah. Sorry, just a point of clarification. Because at my market in their bin, it says dry bags only. So you're saying something about all films that are like. No, 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 no. All right, I just want to make sure. There's like, a, in like, fact, there's a special design label you can get if it can go in. Okay. It can't be a multi layer film, but like Dow and a couple other people are making these multi layer poly polyethylene bags that actually have a retain in them that actually can go into those systems. <clears throat> and there's, a, there's now a, 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 a test. So, so when I wanted to put my X company, internet companies, into that system, I had to get the blessing from Trex in order to do that. We I wouldn't have had that problem two years ago because if we didn't go to Trex, it would go to. Could, so on that, you know, the easy way for consumers is to look for that label for one on the lower left hand this corner. That's the how to recycle label for film. The second way is um, the plasticfilmrecycling.org lists the materials that can go in those bins at the grocery store. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. part of the RAP pro program. That's the point of the RAP program is having good signage to get two bins that show the stuff that can go in there. And ACC has had a program in the past that would sponsor people to help them get this label. See, I'm really helping. Thanks, man. <laughs> But this is part of the public education component here because clearly I've been following this issue closely, didn't know that was true either until just now. Could we make that part of our recommendation? Absolutely. Clearly communicate to people what goes where? And Absolutely. We, we would love to have Rhode Island in the RAP program. That would be a big part yeah, of it. And, and and We're going to ask you for those recommendations in a minute. Hold that thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can join that. Just like you can join Ellen McCarthy, you can join RAP. So I have a question. Now, it's not part of that program, so what is that program? It, it is. Bag actually it actually is. It's the same I, market. I, I, they just, just to make sure that I, I feel righteous when I put it in there, but that's something that's actually being done, or is it just it is. stream somewhere? No, it is. Like, that, when you get those dots, you, you can't, can't, can't you see your dot in there? We are, I, I lost. I lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go into deposits and deposit laws, okay? So, i.e., uh, obviously 25 countries have different deposit laws, mostly in Europe, but not every country in Europe, not, uh, not, not, not even half the countries in Europe. They just have large, good, good recycling. Um, and um, right now, we, we actually caught Resource Recovery and tried to give a, if you had a, any um, recycling rate, um, um, and you don't. So, so you know, we know that we know that's an issue. Um, Basically, a uh, million bottles, on, a billion bottle bottles are littered each year in the United States. Um, Eight billion of them, million tons, um, enter our oceans annually. So there's a huge amount. It's a, it's a huge issue. Um, the recycling rate, um, you know, we also what's what a big issue right now is we really need this plastic. PepsiCo has announced 45% recycled content in all their bottles by, by 2025. Nestle's Borders wants 50% recycled content on the bottle, and they can't get the bottles. They can't get clean bottles, and therefore at a decent price that's competing against the fiber market, because the dirty bottles that are coming out of a normal market is going more into a fiber market than going into a weed bottle. So, so if you look at the difference between, you know, in, in, in your, your plastic bottles, 63% of them are basically recycled in the average of all the U.S. deposit legislations, where presently only 17% of the bottles now in the country that are not in a bottle of state are recycled, are actually put into the recycling system. And we have the same issue with aluminum, and with glass bottles. The other big issue is, and I'm sure you're going to confirm this, is that the value of bottles coming out of the bottle bill program are worth about 16 and a half cents a pound, where the cur curbside bottles are only worth less than a, di a, dime, a dime a pound. So therefore, him selling those bottles, because also because of the 
glass and everything else in our in our system really makes a, 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 a an issue. So we have eleven bottle bills if you want to count wrong in in the United States. Um, four out of the six New England states have bottle bills. What you can see is how the deposit impacts the collection rate. Clearly what the difference is on that. Um, so it, 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 it really makes it the higher deposit, the better the collection rate. If you look at us compared to Europe funds, I'm going to give everyone this power presentation. So you all time. Um, the US this year, according to American Chemical Council, the collection rate of PET bottles went down 3.6%. So 3.6% less bottles were collected this year than last year. This is bottles related to solar beverages, you know. Okay? So our, the U.S. rate is now um, 29, 29.3%. That's actually 26%. I'm sorry. Um, in Europe, the rate has gone up 2.9%. In a lot of countries, it's 90 to 90%. In the low countries, like some of the bad Eastern Europe, European countries, it's down to 30, 40%, which is still, so as compared to, so here's what we generate, here's how much we cycle. Here's what they generate, here's what they recycle. And this is not all bit bottle bill. This is only a, only a fraction of your particular bottle bill too. Probably a little greater than ours, but not much greater. So you can see how they, they, they do that. Um, also, um, we now have a lot of new rules on single-use plastics. Yes, this week, J&J finished getting rid of all of its plastic Q-tips. Their Q-tips are now paper Q-tips. You know, it doesn't weigh that much more. You know, you got to watch the numbers on the conversion. There's a lot of things that we can do conversion. Um, like now, I noticed your Franklin study of 19, 2008, um, the life cycle of your of this coffee thing, but now we have paper-based coffee bags and other bags that don't have that dramatic life cycle impact differences. So you have to look at that with new, with new technologies too. Um, so okay. so um, the brand new directive that was just passed in, 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 in Europe to prevent and recycle single, single, single use plastics and to where possible move out of them if it's it, it, looking at the whole environmental cycle. You can't not look at it. Okay, and, and we have, we're adding new city and state laws almost every day on this. So um, also we have a lot of recycled content comes. This is a very old law that California has requiring all rigid plastic containers to have a certain minimum recycled content. Um, we, think that, we think you can't set up recycling and you can't have recycling MRFs stay in business unless there is demand for the material. So in the whole collection, you have to look at ways to make demand, you know, using recycled content for not just, and this is not just for the plastics, it's for everything. <coughs> um, also, um, as you mentioned, um, California has passed a number of um, new laws just in September. Um, they have the new um, single shore use, which is a strange law. Um, it says it, it only is good for a restaurant that you're escorted to a seat, uh, an escort that you're escorted to a seat and you um, order from behind the counter, um, not the McDonald's or the fast foods at that. Are there other ones with that? But they basically um, have to um, be asked for that. They also now require um, all the food service packaging that's sold at parks, facilities and properties to be either with to be recyclable. Um, and they also have the, the, their new ocean collect protection um, strategy for microplastics. Um, 
and this is the this is what a full service restaurant means escort or assign the seat, you know, beverages, you know. But I, I think that's a little too restricted for, for California. One of the other things that just came out recently is now we're now we're now um, understanding that not only is plastic in all the fish you look at, plastic's in all of us. In that is we they, that they looked at plastics from um, in, in eight different continents, and they found that every every sample of stool contained, contained plastic from the humans around around the world. So plastic is totally in our in, in our in our issues. There's a video here if you want to see it. Um, <laughs> Um, obviously, Rhode Island, Rhode Island has done a lot of great things. Um, they now um, have a one program where every city and town collects the same thing, which had a big difference on contamination rate. We felt that was really, really good. Um, and it, it, it's really necessary in order for us to market our materials. Um, so, there's a money and time. Um, these are sort of the third recommendations I sort of put together. One, I really think that it's really possible for you to work with other states, Washington, uh, New Jersey, uh, actually also Connecticut and, Mass and Massachusetts are looking at these issues also, is looking at this to come up with a US-wide legislation on extended producer responsibility that could work in the US type issue. So in a sense, a goal would be a, a potentially a um, um, a study commission to work with other states to come up. So it's not as burdensome on material producers so that they're all using the same data and all of that for these type of programs. So work on that. The next thing I, I said is, if you were to consider a bottle, we feel that a, a bottle bill that includes I know you're doing plastic, but it's really important that it would include wine and spirits. Because if it does include wine and spirits, it accounts for almost 65 to 70 percent of the glass on the market in Rhode Island. And therefore, and then you would tell solid waste not to take glass. There'd be more collection rates, but it would Stop the glass from, because in Canada, Canada sort of has single stream, but does not include glass. And if you can get that glass out of your paper shards and out of your plastic shards, it's going to raise the value of everything you put through that system. Am I correct there? I believe so. So, you know, in fact, some people have thought of having a glass only deposit bill, including pickle jars. <laughs> So you pickle jaws because it also the ones that aren't do it. But and on the PET side, because he wants the PET, because it's valuable to him, even though 70% of what goes through his facility is fiber. Um, he wants that he wants that PET. Um, and he wants the aluminum cans. Is that that it would kick in for the other materials if you don't reach at least a 50% collection rate on those after a certain time. As a possible way of couching, couching that. That just is an, as a possibility of looking at it. Next thing. And, and what's the deposit rate? Are you going to oh, it's got to be at least. It's got to be done. Got to be done. Got to be done. Got to be done. And what's happening to the glass now in the street? Right now, we are using it as alternative daily cover. There's not any other form of recycle due to changes recently in the market. No viable market to sell that glass. But a glass out of a bottle, a positive legislation, is totally recyclable. Why is that? Well, because in his system, it all gets, you know, you put it in your bin, that bin gets thrown into the garbage truck, the, into the recycling truck. It all breaks, cracks. It gets dumped on the floor of, the, of, of his material processing facility. It's, he doesn't get full, pretty, nice, clean bottles that he can separate out. It's all, it, 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 it gets ground into everything. That's why no country in the world besides the United States collects glass with everything else. They do it separately. Because it lowers, and, and, and since we used to be able to sell all our crappy fiber and crappy plastic to China, 
No one can. Okay, plastic bags. We think that a, a statewide ban, you already have what, 11 communities on it, statewide ban, it, you know, it basically, you know, it, when California passed it, it found that says grocery bags in the litter dropped by 72%. How you structure that, you know, you can do a, a, a fee on the bag, you can do, you know, an alternative, you know, you have all different ones, there's all different models, the California model is pretty good. Um, that's one of the, I would not model California's deposit system, right? You know. EPS, we think that you, there could be an EPS and similar to New York City's polystyrene ban which was just found constitutional. And, you know, if, 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 and if, if New York City can do it, I think Rhode Island can do it, okay? And then the other things that we would look is that we would establish some kind of recycled content and design requirements for a specific date. That, and, and actually, I think Rhode Island has a piece of legislation, already a piece of law that I passed back 25 years ago that allows DEM to designate materials that are contaminants to his system. I think that's still in the books. And if it is, it might be nice to enforce or enforce that. <laughs> now, not to, to yell at DEM, because when I was at DEM, I had a lot of money to do enforcement, because all the money from the, the Rhode Island has a litter tax, and it charges all beverages a fee, and all food for immediate consumption coming out of grocery stores and um, 7-Elevens and Cumberland Farms, a fee, and they pay a tax. And that used to be a restricted receipt account that where we then, we, 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 we did all the commercial recycling audits. We did all of the, 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 the all the enforcement of those those, those products, I remember going into, into um, where, where, okay. So it's going to the general fund now, right? And now the money goes to the general fund. The only person who gets it is the Department of Collection, who picks up some of the litter in the streets. Correction. 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 Yeah. Okay. The RC. And we used to have litter teams. All the communities used to have little, we used to even grant for the summer to have kids clean up the base and, and make signs and do education on litter control. But this is, you know, it's a long time ago. I, I, I had brown hair then. Um, okay, um, so we do think there needs to be some kind of, in this um, recycled content of post-consumer recycled material requirement and a recyclability composting. We also would think that if you really, if you really wanted to light the fire and, and if the governor really wanted to do something which would be dramatic. good, dramatic, would be the first state in the country to join the Ellen MacArthur, which means just tracking and supporting these type of goals. It doesn't, you know, it, 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 and considering all the companies she's trying to get here, J and J and all that, are already members of it, you know, it would be really good. And I know the other ones that we work with up a little bit in Pawtucket are thinking about trying, you know. So, you know, it, I think it would be a good thing for her. Okay. Um, we do not recommend biodegradable, oxydegradable, and packaging because in a lot of cases, and, and some of the requirements like for PLA bottles and all that, the problem with those things are they are contaminated to the waste stream in many cases. And we are we're very leery, and, and, and unless you're in a Seattle that has a really good compost facility that can take special composting plastic. The problem is it's very hard for them to do it. Basically, San Francisco and, and really are the only composting of, the, of, 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 of um, food source material. It's an interesting comment because many of the people that buy plastics that are not currently biodegradable are requesting them. Absolutely. Because of the emotion attached with the litter. And so they're making the assumption that no matter what happens, stuff's going to leak it's going to be litter, and it's going to have their name on it. So it's terrible ad for Frito-Lay, for example, doesn't like to see Frito-Lay bags on the ground. So as much as they support recyclability and reusability and downsizing all that, there's still a strong concern with many corporations with regards to litter. And 
so it, it's an interesting comment because I, I, I share the same view in some regards as a, as a consumer, but you know, as, as, a, as a business, people ask you. To yeah, I, but we, by the way, we, we work with Pepsi, sure. which is futile. and we, and you know, they had that one that was put, but it never come. It, it also gave people a license to litter. So it's going to be gone in 25 years, big deal. It's going to be littered, you know. And they oh, it's going to break into little pieces for the animal and the fish to eat. So um, it really, you know, and then the oxy-degradable stuff in, in Sustainable Packaging Coalition, and I think ACC has a position on, on oxy-degradable plastics against it also. Is there any end-of-life data on the biodegradable stuff? I mean, yeah, it's degradable, like you said, in 25 years. But and it's never degradable in your landfills because your landfills are yes. anaerobic. There, there, there have been stuff, I mean, and biodegradable is a big misnomer. The yeah. stuff that's supposed to be biodegradable is actually supposed to be industrial composting. Yeah. Uh -huh. And most places don't have industrial composting. Right. Then if it's littered, it doesn't degrade. None of it degrades in the ocean either. But, so there's, two, that's that's two, that's two, but there's two words you've got to be careful with. There's biodegradable and biobased. You can make a PET bottle that is not biodegradable out of biobased materials, out of out of sugar cane and things like that. You can make a lot of things out of your Estee Lauder's <coughs> tubes that are like LDPE from Braskin are made from bio-based materials which have a lower carbon footprint, but they're HDPE and they recycle just like any other HDP recycles. Yep. But as part of the education, the word biodegradable needs to be better defined so the consumer understands what it means. Mm -hmm. If it's industrial compostable, or if it means it, you yeah. throw it in the backyard and it disappears in three months, because I think there's a lot of confusion in that. It doesn't mean people don't market the word biodegradable and take advantage of the ignorance. I don't think it's intentional, but if, you're right. if your customers demand biodegradability and you provide biodegradability and they buy it. Well, I always, I always hate these, you go to these cafeterias and they have, and they spend, I was, at, I'm, I'm, I'm up in skiing in Utah and everyone has these biodegradable cups and these biodegradable plastic cups. They're paying extra for them. And what do they do with them? They're going in the same system. They're going in the trash. They're going in the trash. The, and that's an important part to remember with also these EPS bills. No one has ever shown that they actually do anything good for the environment. The litter has gone up in San Francisco. If you look at a litter audit before the EPS ban and after the EPS ban in San Francisco, you will see that litter of the alternatives went up more than the, the polystyrene litter declined. People think they're degradable. They throw them on that's the ground. Don't want to help. So that that's, that's because Seattle and San Francisco has a, has a compostable requirement. This is even for yeah. the paper cups. People think the paper cups are degradable. The ink litter of paper cups went up dramatically. Then there's the other component to a lot of these pieces of legislation. They're totally misleading. They talk about using recyclable or compostable. They don't enforce that component. They don't have composting in most of the jurisdictions. And the recyclability, even a paper cup in most jurisdictions is not recyclable. Absolutely. So the That's big question is, what are you doing by it? And because we're, they we're have higher greenhouse gas emissions. Cup challenge. Hey, OK. Order. Order in the court. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's it. Victor, you're all set? I'm set. OK. So, so that was Victor's last bullet. And um, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I feel like I've learned an awful lot.